OK, we are back from our break and we are going to listen to um, this video from um, Marie Ireland from Virginia. Um, just remember that what she says about Virginia correlates to West Virginia law. I have the ability to help people escape reality, at least for the next. Welcome to the presentation, Speech Sound Disorders and Eligibility in Schools, Integrating New Research with Federal and State Regulation. My name is Marie Ireland. I'm a speech language pathologist and also a board certified specialist in child language. Some of you may have heard that there are new articulation norms. You might have heard a rumor that all sounds are now acquired by age five. If I were you, I would be thinking my caseload's already too big. Before we get too excited, though, let's review the newest research and the requirements for eligibility under IDEA. I want to start by sharing with you the article that started the discussion about speech sound disorders in the United States. In 2018, Sharon McLeod and Kate Crow published something called Children's Consonant Acquisition in 27 Languages Across Linguistic Review. It looked at existing norms from 27 different languages, 64 studies total, and they did say that most sounds were acquired by age six. That created quite a stir here in the United States, and the informed SLP soon put out a blog post called That One Time, a journal article on speech sounds broke the SLP internet. In that article, the informed SLP authors highlighted the difficulties that we Americans were having understanding the difference between the research and decision making in the United States school systems. This resulted in some additional research and collaboration to address the needs that we were having here in the United States. I'm so excited to share with you that one of the outcomes of that collaboration was a new article by Kate Crow and Sharon McLeod, the original authors. It is in press and will be released soon in the American Journal of Speech Language Pathology. And it's called Children's English Consonant Acquisition in the United States, a review. For this study, they reanalyzed the studies of consonant acquisition for researchers who used English, American English. And they also looked at the normative data from our most popular articulation tests here in the United States. They looked at 15 studies and over 18,000 children. One of the things that they found out is that not all tests had separate norms for boys and girls, not all research had separate norms, and that it's true most sounds are acquired by age six. Now hearing that, I had some concerns about how school-based SLPs would be able to use this information. And so I asked them to join me and another author in an second research article. It's called Evaluating Children in U.S. Public Schools with Speech Sound Disorders, Considering Federal and State Laws, Guidance, and Research. Myself, Sharon McLeod, Kate Crow, and Kelly Fakwarson, who's a professor here in Florida, have had that article accepted as well. It will be out this fall in Topics in Language Disorders, and I'm very excited to share that that journal has agreed to make the article free to anybody and available on the internet. In this article, we examine how to use Sharon and Kate's new norms for American English with IDEA and state requirements. And one of the things we highlight is that tests are not the only indicator that we need to be looking at when we consider making children eligible for services. So let's take a minute to look at the eligibility requirements federally under IDEA. In order to qualify as a child with a disability, the team must determine that the child has an impairment, that that impairment results in an educational impact, and that the child requires specially designed instruction to make progress. It's important that we school SLPs work as part of an interdisciplinary team to gather data from a variety of sources, including developmental, functional, and academic information. And that's part of the law under IDEA. Here are a few other reminders for you. 
IDEA prohibits the use of any single measure as the sole criterion for determining if a child has a disability. That means no one test or no one piece of data can make that decision for us. We have to be able to document that we have evaluated a speech sound disorder using the current research, those current norms, that we have examined the educational impact and the need for specially designed instruction. So now let's take a look at making evidence-based eligibility decisions. In order to do that and comply with federal and state regulations, it's important that school SLPs certainly understand the requirements of IDEA, that you know your state regulations, rules, eligibility criteria, that you're familiar with your state and local guidance and resources, and of course, have an understanding of what evidence is in our professional literature. Remember, state regulations differ, and so it's important to use your own state and local guidance to stay in compliance. Let's take a minute to review how to document educational impact. Educational impact can mean a variety of things. It can be an academic impact, such as an inability for a child to spell or read correctly because of their speech sound disorder. The evidence for that is going to be found in children's writing samples and perhaps even teacher running records of oral reading. A child can also have an educational impact that is behavioral or social emotional. That could be a fear of speaking publicly because they're embarrassed. It could be students who are being teased or choose to not participate rather than have their speech sound disorder be heard by others. The way to document behavioral and social emotional educational impact can be through observations in the classroom, interviews with the child, and questionnaires. It's important to understand that other members of the team may be sharing this information with you, classroom teachers, parents, even building administrators. Let's take a moment to review some different resources that can help document educational impact. The first is the ICS, the Intelligibility in Context Scale. It is a free parent report tool that's available in over 60 languages. It helps document children's intelligibility with different communicative partners. It's a wonderful tool to share with teachers as well. Another tool you can use to document educational impact is Percent Consonants Correct. In 2004, Johnson, Weston, and Bain created a more efficient way to calculate percent consonants correct using an imitative task that you score directly on a list of sentences. Here's a picture of Virginia's version of the percent consonant correct imitative sentence scoring form. You'll see the directions are listed on the top, and then there are 36 sentences for the child to imitate. You can score right on the paper and do the calculation at the bottom. If you would like to access this, you can look at the original article from Johnson, Weston, and Bain in the American Journal of Speech-Language Pathology, or you can access the form on the Virginia Department of Education website. It's important to take a moment and consider how your school teams document educational impact for speech sound disorders. Do you currently have teacher data to support an academic need that is shown by writing samples or running oral records? Do you have interviews and observation data to show the social emotional impact of a speech sound disorder? If you don't have this documentation, and the only thing you're using is your articulation norms then you are truly not meeting the requirements of IDEA. When you look back, if you do not have robust information for documenting educational impact, then it's important to take a moment 
and consider how you can add that to your evaluation repertoire and ask others to contribute data to the meeting. Now let's take a look at documenting the need for specially designed instruction. Specially designed instruction is the third prong of the definition of special education under IDEA. In order to document this, we have to examine if a child requires specially designed instruction to correctly produce a speech sound. This includes stimulability or modifiability. Well, some of you may be saying, the standardized test I use has a stimulability component built in, and that's great. You want to make sure that you complete that and you look at the stimulability data to determine if the child requires specially designed instruction. If you do not have a standardized test with built-in stimulability, then another tool you can use is the Missio probe. The Missio probe looks at stimulability of speech sounds in isolation and in three vowel contexts. E as in me, ah as in father, and oo as in hoop looks at the sound in initial, medial, and final position with each of these vowels. If a child can produce the sound correctly with a model 30% of the time, they are considered stimulable and would not need specially designed instruction to make the sound correctly. This is a picture of what a stimulability probe in Virginia looks like. It includes the sounds across the top with the prompt, look at me, listen and say what I say. And then you prompt only for the sounds that are in error. Here again, we're at a time where we need to stop and pause and consider how do we as speech language pathologists and members of an eligibility group document the need for specially designed instruction. If a child is stimulable and can produce sounds 30% of the time through a variety of vowel contexts, then it's important for us to ask, do they really need specially designed instruction or can they grow that skill with some home practice or reminders from the general education teacher? The stimulability data from your standardized norm reference test or from something like the Missio probe can help you document whether a child is stimulable for a speech sound error, or if they are not stimulable, requires the help of a speech language pathologist. And therefore, the answer to that question about specially designed instruction would be yes. This is the third prong of the IDEA definition, and it's really important that you have data to support this. Again, who helps bring this information to the team and does the team understand that this is a requirement of IDEA? As we think about speech sound disorders and eligibility in U.S. schools, it's critical that we pause for a moment and consider civil rights. Identification of a child as disabled who does not meet the federal definition of special education is a civil rights violation. There may be negative educational consequences as teachers' and parents' expectations diminish, and it is a violation of a child's civil rights to call them handicapped or disabled when they're not. To address the challenge with over-identification, IDEA requires states to submit disproportionate representation data in specific disability categories. Every time you do a new eligibility, in five categories, and speech language impairment is one of those. It's very important to understand that across the country, folks are paying attention to who is being made eligible for special education and do they really have a disability? What are the clinical implications for you as an SLP? Well, most importantly, you have to consider multiple sources of data document all three prongs of the definition of special education, and be sure not to prioritize one source of data, like a standardized test score or norm, over others. We have to strictly adhere to the federal and state requirements 
And if we do that, it really may end up helping our caseload challenges as well. Now, professionals outside of the school setting also should be aware of these differences because sometimes a private evaluator may suggest that a child needs therapy. It's important not to pressure public school professionals into inappropriately finding a child disabled and qualifying them for services. When students are not eligible under IDEA, parents can seek clinical services outside of the school setting. That could be through a private practice, an outpatient clinic, a university clinic, or someone in the community. Speech and language services may also be offered in general education for children with speech sound disorders. That can be through the multi-tiered systems of support <coughs> or IRTI initiatives that may be present where you live and work. Those services are appropriate for students who are stimulable or who do not demonstrate an educational impact. Another approach to helping students who don't meet the criteria for IDEA is to do a pre-referral intervention. This could include a home practice program, before and after school practice, or time-limited intervention groups. In Virginia, we have groups called speech busters and sound breakers, and those children come together for six to eight weeks, target a specific sound, and see if they can fix their own problems. It's important to check with your state and local school district for guidance on how general education SLP services can be offered. I want to also draw your attention to ASHA's admission and discharge criteria. They list factors that are appropriate for admission and discharge. Some of them align well with IDEA and some of them do not. Factors that align with IDEA, including a child who's unable to communicate functionally or optimally across environments and with communication partners. Also, children whose communication skills negatively affect educational, social, emotional, or vocational performance. There are some factors in ASHA's admission and discharge criteria that are not appropriate to consider in schools. Those include failure to pass a screening assessment for communication, which relies on a single source of data, and we know IDEA forbids us from using a single source of data. The other factor in ASHA's admission and discharge criteria that is not appropriate to use in school is an individual, family, or guardian seeks to enhance communication skills. That desire for enhancement is wonderful for parents to strive to make their children's lives as rich and robust as possible, but it is not sufficient to call a child disabled under IDEA. Here on the screen are a variety of additional resources in speech sound disorders. There are five articles that talk about a variety of factors, tests, norms, single sound errors, and assessing social impact. There are also two podcasts if you want to learn more or broaden your view. As we wrap up, let's just take a moment to remember that to be eligible for speech and language services in U.S. schools under IDEA, a team must determine that a student has an impairment, that that impairment results in an educational impact it could be academic, it could be social emotional, but it, there does have to be data to document what that impact is. And the third prong, the child requires specially designed instruction to make progress. If a child is stimulable 30% of the time or more, research tells us that they do not need specially designed instruction and they can learn to broaden their use of a speech sound with home practice, and reminders from others. I've included a list of references with links to the articles that I've mentioned in this talk. If you have questions about eligibility for speech sound disorders under IDEA in public schools in the United States, please contact your state education agency for additional information. Okay. <clears throat> uh.
All right. Um, so I hope that gave you some um, a different perspective than maybe you've had in the past and lets you see too. Like I said, we didn't just pull these things out of the air. Um, we tried to find research based, evidence based um, structure and um, tried to use that to create West Virginia's guidance. And um, it's just not something that we have pulled out of, like I said, out of thin air. So I did see a question from Anne about us adding um, phonological processes under the phonological process um, column. Um, I'll have to look at that, Anne. What we've been trying to do is try to use the forms um, as strictly as possible because they've been tried and true. I mean, tried and used um, for several years now, and um, we're hoping they're tried and true resources for us. So. Um, we'll definitely look at that. And like I said, the nice thing of having everything in our guidance document now is we can make changes as necessary. OK, so um, I asked you to go ahead and get your um, caseload list if you could. And I'd like for you to just take one minute to look at that list and in your head, think about the um, students that you have on that class list and think about the ones that you actually have information to support all three prongs of eligibility for. Um, just be honest with yourself because I'm not going to see it. I'm not going to ask for you to respond in any way. I just want you to really look at it and be honest with yourself about whether or not those students were placed using the three prongs. You can just kind of keep a running tally in your head as you read the name. Just think do I have all the information and kind of go from there. I'm willing to bet as you've gone through your list that you found between five and ten students who maybe would not have met the eligibility criteria or that you didn't have all the information um, to prove that they met it. Um, so just keep that in mind as you move forward and just remember that now we our guidance is that you need to be able to prove all three prongs. Um, we can't just check put a check mark and say yep there might be um, an impact. Uh, we have to show it and prove it. Um, for those students who you don't have that information for, who don't have an impact, um, educational impact, you can always use the STEPS program. Um, it's best, it's based on the um, MTSS model. Um, it can be used with students who would benefit from early intervention, prevention strategies, and students um, who do not have adverse impact. Remember, if they do have an adverse impact, you need to consider them for an IEP. Um, in the STEPS program, we are redoing our um, website right now, but um, there are videos for each part of the STEPS program. We have documents that you can use um, that have been um, designed in our graphics department. Um, we do recommend that you have um, parent permission uh, to do the STEPS program so that they're understanding why their child is is having contact with an SLP. Um, but the steps program can be used, you know, through universal intensive and targeted, I mean, targeted and intensive um, ways too. So we didn't make it completely follow the MTSS model because there are certain things that happen with it that we didn't want to confine you to um, have to have to do. Um, and the question we always get asked is if they go through the steps program and they don't self correct, do we then go to referral? And the answer to that is no, um, it's not an automatic. Um, if by that point there is some type of adverse impact on educational performance and you can document that, then that could be a consideration, but it's not an automatic. If you go to steps, then you, you don't make progress, then you get an IEP. Um, and just remember too that you can use the STEPS program for any students that you 
um, want to dismiss, but the parents a little concerned about not having the student not having contact with you anymore, that kind of thing. You can use it to periodically check on them, give them a little tune up if they need it and um, follow them that way instead of having an IEP. Um, and there's just my contact information for that. While I get the next um, PowerPoint up, um, I'll just let you know that we are going to go over language now. Since we have <laughs> talked about um, the comprehensive evaluation piece, we won't have to go through that again. Did the wrong thing. Hold on one second. I just cannot talk and share at one time. OK, I think we're ready now. And I'll keep monitoring the chat. If you have any questions, just you know, just be sure and put put it in there, and I will we'll look at it. Um, we're going to be talking about language now. We've already talked about speech and the overview for the components of the comprehensive evaluation. So um, changes to the language eligibility. We did add the words um, content, form, and function to the um, definition. And uh, we did add that the onset of symptoms may be evident in the early developmental period or when academic language demands in the classroom increase. If you were able to attend any of Dr. Brandel's trainings that we did on language and um, especially her training on academic language, um, we gave out the Marilyn Nopold book um, as a resource for that one. but. As those academic language demands become more intense, then we can start seeing some of the underlying language breakdowns that maybe we didn't pick up um, through a developmental test. Um, so um, that information was added. We also added that following consideration of the child's age, culture, social economic status, language background and dialect, um, they have to meet all the following criteria um, because culture and language background and dialect is really important when you're talking about English learners and social economic status in West Virginia is an extremely important consideration. So we did add that um, piece um, to the precursor statements. And then here again, we've got three probes, um, three probes or, or standardized speech language assessments. And um, um, if they cannot participate, um, you can also use the functional communication assessment summary. And like I said, we'll go over that in a little bit. So you have five options, A through E, and you need to choose at least three. Doesn't mean you can only choose three. It means you have to choose at least three of the five. So the first one is assessment on a norm reference test of both receptive and expressive language with a diagnostic accuracy, and that means the sensitivity and specificity of 80% or higher yields one or more composite scores. You have to use a composite score um, that align with those who have a language disorder based on the test publisher's recommended cut score. So instead of using that 78 cut score, we are going to be using the test publisher's recommended cut score that they have designated um, that's at least 80% um, accurate for sensitivity and specificity. And that simply means the sensitivity is how accurately they identify students who do have an issue and specificity is how accurately they do not. I mean, they identify students who don't have an issue. So um, just remember that only cuts, I mean, composite scores can be used. Individual subset scores may not be considered for A. Um, we do have, and you'll see it in just a minute, we do have a test card 
um, I've sent that uh, draft to the test card out for you guys to be using until it's designed in our graphics and part of the um, SOP guidance document. Um, but it has the test that you would generally use listed and um, it has the recommended cut scores and the sensitivity and specificity. So you don't have to go and look up that for each um, test that you might use. Um, language sample analysis results in a score of at least 1.5 standard deviations or more below the mean. Um, and on at least two measures of productivity or complexity. Um, and that um, is B that um, the 1.5 standard deviations, if you're going to use that piece, um, you probably need to use the SALT lab or a program that's like the SALT program. Sugar is a free one that you can use as well, um, but you do have that option to use that language sample analysis through the WVU SOLID lab, and we're going to talk about that in just a minute. Um, dynamic assessment which is just test, teach, retest, um, to demonstrate, demonstrates limited or very limited improvement. So dynamic assessment is just trying to see how quickly they can learn something and how modifiable their um, language processes are. So um, dynamic assessment is something you probably do all the time. You just don't call it that. Um, I've been asked by several people, well, where is the dynamic assessment form? Um, we're going to watch a, an ASHA video on dynamic assessment in just a couple of minutes, and you're going to see that there's not one form, that the dynamic assessment is going to be different for each student. Um, but both the um, language sample analysis and the dynamic assessment have been proven um, to be very valuable when you're working with English learners and trying to do evaluations for them. Um, because all the research said that our speak, that our language tests were not as um, diagnostically accurate as we thought they were. I mean, you would think if somebody has a test published that it meets all the diagnostic accuracy criteria. Um, unfortunately, um, our test did not. So <clears throat> because of that, we did um, try to go um, with the newest research that says that we have to pick ones that are at least 80% accurate, accurate, because if we don't, then we're inaccurately identifying students with disabilities. And here again, that's a violation of civil rights. The other thing we could be doing is not picking up students that we should have been picking up because of that 78 standard score. So <clears throat> I do realize, though, that you still have tests um, that can provide some really valuable information um, that maybe don't have that diagnostic accuracy, especially if you're using it to test a certain area of language, like test a pragmatic language, just as an example. So with this criteria on D, you're still going to be able to use those tests um, to test those specific areas, and you're going to be able to use those ones who don't meet that diagnostic accuracy of 80%, but you can only use that test if you do A, if you do the one that is diagnostically accurate um, and that does provide that composite score. You know, these scores, um, some of the tests that you give um, that would go along with D um, maybe don't have composite scores, so you can still use that information, but you have to give a test that's diagnostically accurate if you're going to use it. And then your option for E is that um, you can use case history information, observation, parent teacher interviews, and informal assessments. Informal assessments can be anything that you kind of want to use to show what your child can and can't do. Um, one example might just be a list of basic concepts that they that they um, understand and can accurately identify and name. Um, basic concepts are extremely important for classroom directions and and that kind of thing. So that might be some informal assessment that you decide to use. Um, but using that information indicates that the student has difficulty understanding or expressing ideas, and it significantly interferes with social interaction or educational progress. 
um, here again for preschool, we're talking about social communicative and impact. If you look at these options, A through E, you can see that you could potentially have an eligibility um, determination for a student without giving one standardized test. Um, you could use the language sample analysis, you could use a dynamic assessment and then case history information and that kind of thing to gather the information that you need. Um, and in a lot of ways, those observations and that teacher interview and that kind of thing is going to give you specific information regarding the student's educational impact that that discrete language test um, standardized language test does not give you um, because they um, test discrete skills. They don't test how they're applied in the classroom. Um, and what's happened in the past is we've taken those discrete skills that they've tested on, and that's what we've used to write our goals um, for language therapy. The newest research says that is not an appropriate way to do it. Number one, the student is um, um, you can't always um, see everything that they um, are having difficulty with by looking at just those test scores. Um, but you can you also may not know what the difficulty is um, without having the observation and the parent and the teacher information. Um, just working on those discrete skills doesn't apply to the classroom. What the research does apply is narrative um, therapy, like using the Story Champs program. And we gave out 250 of those across the state um, after Dr. Brandel did trainings on language. Uh, the skills program, we gave out 250 of those. Um, and it did a make and take session with those um, to be able to to provide you with some th um, therapy intervention materials that do meet the, the newest research as far as narrative um, intervention instead of working on those discrete skills because working on plurals with you or opposites with you doesn't easily translate into the classroom. I think that's one of the reasons you're not seeing progress maybe that you should for those students and that you're, um, you know, continuing to work with them year after year, either that or you keep having to choose new items and they're still having that academic impact. Um, even if you switch from plurals to possessives, that academic impact is still there because you're not address addressing it directly. So um, I see a question from Anne. It says if a student scores on PLS 5 or within normal range, but does not meet average range for BE, they can qualify for service. Does not meet average range for B and E. Oh, okay, you mean choices B and E. <clears throat> Language sample analysis and the case history and that kind of thing. Yeah, your eligibility committee can look at that information and determine, you know, how much impact there is. Um, that one test, the PLS-5, um, you know, it may show issues, it may not. Um, and that's one of the things um, we have to be careful of too, um, is making sure that we do find out exactly what those, what that impact is and how um, to address it. Okay, and so this is again, prong two, um, do they meet that? Um, and then prong three, do they need specialized instruction? And here again, the same statements that have always been there about primary um, service or uh, related service and about um, hearing impairments, um, maybe being the primary disability, if that's the, the case. Um, we had WVU um, create a test review summary for us. Um, it has updated test information and it has the um, diagnostic accuracy listed. I've been asked if we can average these scores, if you know, for tests that don't meet it for both. And the answer is no, they both have to meet the 80% accuracy. What you will see though, is that there are different cut scores. And for the different cut scores, there are different accuracies and uh, for sensitivity and specificity. 
The reason both are listed is it gives you the option to use your professional judgment to determine which one to use. Um, that gives you the most um, diagnostic, the best diagnostic accuracy. Or if you look at what the test, how the test was normed, um, like other considerations over here, it says the disorder population didn't include all age groups. Well, that's something you can take into consideration when you determine which which score to use. Um, we also wanted to have a card for you because this document is several pages long. Um, we also wanted to have a document for you that has just a quick reference um, for you. It has the evaluation, the language areas, the age ranges, and then the sensitivity, specificity, and cut scores. So that um, the drafts have been sent to you to be using until they're designed, but you will be getting this um, as a part of the guidance document and um, as, a, as a separate test card that you can you know, use and keep in your logbook or you know wherever you want to keep it so it's a handy quick reference for you. Um, during the comment period, there were several people who commented that the use of language sample analysis was something that was done um, in the olden days. <laughs> Um, many years ago that it was no longer appropriate, that um, that it wasn't something that is used now um, by therapists. In actuality, language sample analysis has seen um, a big up, uptick. Um, there, like I said, there are several programs that will do it for you. Um, salt and sugar are, are two of them. Um, but I wanted to show you the research too that says um, the diagnostic accuracy of distinguishing a language difference from a dis from an impairment um, is substantially increased when language sample analysis is used in conjunction with standardized testing. And where you're trying to determine that language difference from a an impairment is especially for those students who um, are English learners, but it's also important for any students student that you're testing for um, language um, therapy potentially. Um, and research also shows that diagnostic accuracy of narr narrative retells is high in addition to being a sensitive indicator of language impairment. So um, here again, the language um, difference versus disorder issue is listed, but just remember that's a sensitive indicator of language impairment to say that we're not going to do that because we think it's an outdated method um, isn't supported by the research. Um, so there also is um, current research that says um, language sample analysis is the gold standard uh, for children who are learning more than one language and difficulties with narrative comprehension and production have been linked to the students difficulties with reading comprehension, writing and social achievement. So that's all important information for us to have. Now, when we first started realizing back seven years ago um, how important the narrative language sample analysis was going to be, I knew that you guys do not have time to do that. Um, it's time consuming, um, it can be confusing, and I knew you didn't have time. So we created in conjunction with WVU, um, the School Age Language Acquisition and Disorders Lab. We've been talking about that lab for five or six years now, and I hope that some of you have actually tried it and, and turned in language samples to be analyzed. and. Um, have found the information in the reports um, um, that can be helpful to you not, and, and they even recommend what to target um, for therapy. So um, using the salad lab is free of charge. Um, they have a two week turnaround. Uh, we just renewed the grant that we provide to them to hire people to um, do the diagnostic um, analyzation for us, for you. And um, we are also going to be um, very cognizant of the fact that people have said, as we've trained about the Sal Lab in the past, that they want to be able to do it themselves. They want to know how to do the program themselves and be able to um, do their own 
language sample analysis. Um, we've already talked um, to Dr. Brandle and Karen Haynes about doing some trainings for us in the spring. So you can do that. Um, I do realize that at some point WVU is going to be going to be saying, um, you know, it's just too much. The load is just too much. So um, we're going to be training trainers <laughs> um, for each county uh, to be able to do your own and then hopefully provide a grant to each county to get your um, county um, site license for using the, the salt or sugar program, whichever one you choose. Um, but um, just know that for right now, you can send upload everything to WVU. We're actually going to be doing um, a new training on this um, sometime in the next two weeks um, because Dr. Brandle has said that we're only about half the people in the state had taken advantage of the of the lab before um, having to start turning them in. Some people are making some mistakes that they don't intend to make, like they're prompting during the um, narrative sample um, acquisition and that kind of thing. So it's going to be a two hour training to go only go over not only the the process and um, how to upload them, that kind of thing, but how to interpret the reports. Um, there are videos on the SALAD website that tell you exactly how to do everything. And um, you can just record on an app on your iPad. I would not record on your personal cell phone. If you have a county app iPad, um, I would use that to upload your, your um, sample. Um, we have made um, additions to the evaluation forms um, so that part of the language evaluation or part of the communication evaluation, it might include um, uploading a language sample, a recorded language sample. Um, they're audio samples. They are not visual samples. We can't do sign language um, language sample analysis because there's no one who can adequately interpret that at WVU. Um, so um, just remember um, the salad lab is there for you and available. And once you get over the, the nerves of doing it once or twice, I have friends who kept telling me this was so ridiculous, they shouldn't have to do it, who now say that's one of the main things I do every single time. So um, just give it a chance, keep that open mind, try it a couple of times, do one on your own child. Um, if you have one or, you know, another one of your students who maybe doesn't have a language difficulty so you can practice and get the, the process down. Um, they, WVU also has resources that you can check out for free and they're, everything's mailed to you for free and they give you a return shipping label. They have tests, all the tests at the WVU lab have um, the right sensitivity and specificity, and um, you can check them out there. If you don't have one that you want to use, they also have iPads with um, resources on there for doing therapy that are um, evidence based and um, it's just a really good spot. They also have the books that you need. We gave away the books with the um, skill programs, um, the books that you have to use to gather um, some of the narrative language samples like frog and toad books and that kind of thing. But honestly, a lot of those books are in your school library if you don't have them. But we have sets of them you can also check out from the salad lab. This is an ASHA video um, regarding um, dynamic assessment. And we are going to um, go ahead and um, watch this one. I think it's about 13 minutes. It's Dr. Elizabeth Pena who's doing it and there's a four part module series um, and you'll be getting the, the link to um, all the other modules and also the link to Dr. Brandel's training that she did. It's a 90 minute training on just dynamic assessment um, that's available as well as the PowerPoint. So let's go ahead and watch this video and See if this doesn't help um, with your concerns. Hi. Sorry, I forgot to turn the volume down. Okay. Hi, I'm Liz Pena, and I'm going to be talking about dynamic assessment today. So, what is dynamic assessment? 
First, my speaker disclosure is that I am a professor and associate dean of faculty development and diversity at the University of California at Irvine. And I'm receiving compensation um, from the American Speech and Hearing Association for this uh, module. So today we're gonna talk about how we compare dynamic assessment to other assessment. Um, dynamic assessment approaches or to other assessment approaches, we're going to talk about what makes dynamic assessment dynamic and um, what we should use as the um, dynamic assessment pre-test and post-test. Also, we're going to consider how dynamic assessment differs from um, assessments, including standardized assessment, observations, and response to intervention. Some overlap, but there are some differences as well. So what makes dynamic assessment dynamic? Well, one of the things that makes it dynamic is that the focus is more on the learning process rather than on how kids perform on a standardized test or a probe. Um, so it's really important to be observant of what children are doing during that learning. Um, we look at the amount and nature of the examiner investment. So how hard did somebody have to work to get that kid to make some changes? It's very interactive. So you make decisions in the moment about what might help the child perform at a higher level. And we're really focused on the process rather than on child outcomes. Um, in terms of selecting a test, what you want to do is select a probe or a measure that really samples the language skills of interest. We want it to be something that is sensitive to short-term changes. So um, a lot of um, examples of a certain kind of item, for example, might be a better way of probing uh, a child language skill. Um, than a broad-based measure. And we want to be able to capture emerging knowledge and performance. So it's not, we want to be able to rate something on like a scale. Is it um, close to the target? Is it exactly the target? Is it um, completely different from the target? Um, and um, so that helps us to capture what children are learning in a very short um, amount of time. So how do dynamic assessment approaches differ from other approaches? Well, here's a chart that shows um, a summary of, of some of these. So um, for standardized assessment or static assessment, um, participants are passive. So you go in, you test, and you're not supposed to interfere with the child's um, performance or with the child's answers. You're not supposed to cue them. So the examiner has a very neutral stance on what they're doing. The examiner's role is to really observe what the child can do pretty independently. Um, standardized tests are also used to describe needs or areas of difficulty, and it's given in a really standardized way, way so that um, you give that measure the same way every time you give it to a different child. Um, in dynamic assessment, it's a little bit different. So both the child and the examiner are really active and the examiner is actively participating and intervening and um, supporting the, child's the child learning during that language assessment. So you're watching and hypothesizing and then getting in there and trying to make that child's performance a little bit better. The goal is to describe modifiability or how the child can change. Um, and so the protocol is really flexible and adaptable. So you have permission to go off script and to um, you know, make hypotheses about what you think the child's needs are, try to do a mini support for that um, process or that procedure, and then see how they do with that. Um, so how is dynamic assessment different from observation? So observation is a really important aspect of assessment, um, but in observation, usually examiners are, examiners are more neutral. So you're kind of um, in the room, observing, watching, and developing hypotheses about what happens and why that happens, and it helps you to compare performance across contexts. In dynamic assessment, that examiner is going to be more active and so they may get into the child's space to intervene to try to help the child perform better on a specific um, linguistic task. So that's one difference um, from observation. Um, how is dynamic assessment different from response to intervention? 
Um, and response to intervention, I think, has a lot of um, similarities to dynamic assessment. So we look at child responsiveness in both. We look at child learning in both. We want to document intervention that leads to change in both. And we look at outcomes in both. But where they differ is in the approach. So dynamic assessment starts with testing and then teaching and retesting. In um, response to intervention, the focus is more on teaching and then testing and then reteaching. Um, in terms of the number of sessions, dynamic assessment uses relatively few sessions. So you're just trying to look at emerging knowledge or ability to change. And you do it in one, two, or three sessions, typically. Um, response to intervention is usually over several weeks. So 10 weeks, 15 weeks, a whole semester. And so you're looking at um, whether children are retaining that information and using the information that they're learning. Um, dynamic assessment can be used um, or is typically used in special education to determine uh, whether a child has a language impairment or a developmental language disability. And um, RTI is used as a tiered intervention within the regular education um, domain. Um, and then um, the focus is a little bit different in dynamic assessment. We look at what works and why it works that way. And in um, response to intervention, we're looking at what tier or what level of support works best for that child. So now we've explored the concept of dynamic assessment. And in the next activity, we're going to review some examples of um, these concepts. So what is dynamic assessment? Let's review some examples. Um, so here we have a girl, Vicki. She's six years old and she's in the first grade. Her teacher referred her to the speech language pathologist because she's concerned about her language and literacy skills. The speech language pathologist gives her the test of narrative language. The scores indicate difficulty with narrative comprehension and narrative production. What is this? So this is an example of a static test. So it's a standardized test. The examiner administers the test according to the manual, same way that you would give it to any child. And you score the stories um, and the questions, and you obtain a standardized score um, for comprehension and for production, and then uh, um, like a, a more comprehensive score as well. And this score helps us to determine whether the child has a, a, a developmental language disability. Um, next, SLP might observe Vicki during reading instruction, and she notices that Vicki has difficulty decoding words. So here, the speech pathologist is, make, is doing an observation. So through these observations, she's able to make hypotheses about Vicki's instructional needs um, that are based on observations, that are based on what she sees in the classroom setting. Um, Next, um, the, we find out that Vicki tests in the lowest quartile on a reading test, and the school recommends Vicki for the early interventions and reading program that's focused on letter sound knowledge, reading fluency, and curricular vocabulary. And so this is a standard curriculum that's a tier two curriculum. And after 16 weeks, she's going to be retested to see if she's on target for reading. Um, so this is an example of response to intervention. The 16-week program is a two-tier intervention that's focused on getting Vicki's skills up to speed. Um, and then the SLP notices also that um, her Vicki's TNL stories are not well organized. And so the SLP works on stories that include elements in to um, include a problem statement, an attempt, and a resolution. She observes and reports on Vicki's strategies during that teaching session and the kinds of supports that she needs to improve her stories. And this is an example of dynamic assessment. So the focus is on the process of learning and what the child needs um, in order to make um, change in her story. So, um, in the next five minutes, um, what you need to do or what, you, what um, is planned for you to do is um, your turn to practice. So here's um, a plan statement. So 
um, what you want to think about the who, the what, and the how. And think about a child that you're um, currently testing or have tested recently. Is there a diagnostic question that you can answer using dynamic assessment? What should, what is the focus of the concern? And what are your hypotheses regarding how best to support learning in this area? And then how can you test this out using principles of dynamic assessment? Let's try your plan. So spend five minutes at work um, putting your plan into action. So dynamic assessment can be really powerful to determine what works, what doesn't work, why a child might be having difficulty, and you use the dynamic assessment to test that out. Um, if you don't have um, somebody that you're working with right now that this could um, work for, maybe explain this um, process to a colleague. How can they use dynamic assessment to differentiate between language difference and language disorder? Um, and here you might um, jot down some reflections, um, what, um, what went well in your plan, what happened, how can we make um, improvement? So think about um, what your teaching target was, how did you test and retest? Um, what was the child's response to that teaching? What did they pick up on? What was difficult? Um, what else do you need to know to make a diagnostic decision? How does it inform your um, testing? Okay, like I said, this is um, part one of a four part series. Um, and Dr. Pena goes into different aspects of the dynamic assessment in the other videos. They are all under, I think, 18 minutes each. And um, I will drop the links um, in your resource folder so you'll have access to them if you want to watch um, further and find out more about it. The link for Dr. Brandel's 90-minute video will also be available there. Um, I just wanted to mention criterion reference tests um, because that seems to be a um, point of confusion even though in school we were trained on what criterion's referenced assessments were. Um, you know if you haven't thought about it in that term those terms for, for several years, um, I can see where a refresher would be helpful. So um, they measure an individual's performance against a set of predetermined criteria. Um, so you'll see tests like the um, communication matrix, for instance, that that gives you information um, that you, you know, determine. It's like a questionnaire information that you determine for the child, and then it tells you about what age that child is typically, children at that age typically do the skills the child demonstrates. So um, it's descriptions like that they um, either have mastered it or they um, haven't used it or it's emerging. You see those types of ratings for these types of tests instead of, um, you know, uh, correct or incorrect and you um, get, um, a, you don't get a standard score um, for these tests. Um, so using um, criterion reference tests, you would not use one of those for um, A, I mean B or E, uh, for instance. It's A and E um, in the language references. So um, just, you know, just a quick reminder of what criterion reference tests are. Um, we do have a list of them in the um, guidance document. Um, this is the top of the um, language assessment summary. And now that we know how it works, I'm just going to go through this really quickly. Um, you know, you're going to look for your academic areas again. Um, and um, you're going to look for um, proof, you know, that they do have what the academic impact is. Um, either academic or educational overall, if it's social, of course, and that kind of thing. Um, you're going to look for the academic tests and measures. You know, here again, you're, you can look at what they can't do on the college and career readiness standards. That's a measure. Um, what they can't do, I mean, how they did on um, Dibble's testing and that kind of thing. All that information can go under those two columns. 
Um, and then here again, your probes that you're used to using and your, t your tests, um, those are going to go under the blue areas to show that impairment, whether it exists and how it impacts the student. So here again, we have descriptions. Um, and, you know, for instance, if you use the dynamic assessment, demonstrates improvements during dynamic assessment. Um, if they do that, then there's going to be a minimal or no apparent impact because that's more indicative of a language difference instead of a disorder. If, on the other hand, you're looking at moderate impact and it says um, demonstrated limited improvement during dynamic assessment, that gives you additional information to let you know, yep, there really is an impact here. They're having difficulty learning the um, the material. This is another case where I'm sure you're thinking to do this dynamic assessment, I need to be able to pull this child multiple times. And yes, you're right, you do. It may just be for five minutes, depending on what you're doing the dynamic assessment for. Um, it may be for a little longer, but here again, having that scheduling flexibility because you're using a different service delivery model than pull out um, you know, once or twice a week uh, and keeping, you know, your, your students scheduled back to back um, all month long, um, that's going to be difficult if you have that type of schedule. So um, it's just one thing to consider if you have the support of your um, administration um, that, that when you do your IEP reviews and that kind of thing that you start um, trying to for the students that it's appropriate to use it with um, change them to either three to one or four to one um, and we do have reference information for the those scheduling models and we have webinars available for them we've tried really hard to make videos of all this information and you know we've sent them out um, as uh, email emails on the list serve so that you could you know watch this information over and over if you needed to or just watch it when you had some time or when it became appropriate for you um, and so we'll continue to have those resources available for you um, so this is what it looks like for the moderate impact and then for substantial impact extensive difficulty with the skills demonstrates very limited improvement with dynamic assessment discourse analysis is greater than 1.5 standard deviations so this is going to help you determine where you would um, where it would fall um, where the students functioning and um, the meta skills, um, meta skills, those definitions have been around for a while and they're in the guidance document as well. So if you're not sure, um, you know, in a lot of cases, meta skills are thinking about thinking, um, you know, thinking about language, that kind of thing. But it's how they use those skills to incorporate and use language that's important. So um, there's also information regarding the meta skills in the guidance document. Um, that is all um, I had for the language piece. Now we're going to talk about um, some other changes that we made. Um, for childhood fluency disorder, we added the definition of um, and diagnostic criteria um, for cluttering because cluttering is one of the disorders that's listed under fluency. Um, and we removed the use of the suggested guidelines for fluency as eligibility criteria because they weren't available any longer on the um, internet. And so we didn't want to keep using information that was um, outdated. Um, same thing for the voice rating scale. Um, and just added um, to use any age appropriate voice rating scale that you might want to use. Um, that's up to your clinical judgment, your professional judgment, or your um, lead SLP or your director um, to determine, you know, what you would use for that. Just a reminder, too, that you still need um, clearance and authorization from an otolaryngologist before placing any student in voice therapy. Um, for social pragmatic communication disorder, 
as I've gone around and done training, I realized that there was a huge confusion in some districts about um, the pragmatic piece of the com social communication disorder. Because pragmatics was listed specifically in that eligibility category, um, there were some people who felt like that's the only place you could get pragmatic um, therapy or qualify someone for pragmatic services. That is not the case. Um, you can always um, use um, the um, language eligibility, language disorder eligibility to provide um, pragmatic services. Um, and for students with autism, that's exactly where they, they should receive it. Um, what was happening was where it said pragmatic, social pragmatic communication disorder, people would say, well, we have to rule out autism for, um, for this category. So those kids with autism can't get pragmatic services. Well, because communication and deficits in communication, especially pragmatics, is part of the definition, the very definition of autism, of course, we need to support them uh, with that. And ASHA has a position statement on that, um, saying that we should definitely be supporting them in conjunction, like with any ABA programs and that kind of thing, and to work collaboratively. But with this, we were moved. Um, the pragmatic, because now on in ASHA um, and on the ASHA website, it's called Social Communication Disorder or SCD, and um, we changed it to um, reflect that. And we also added a statement that SCD is a primary disability and not a related service, because what was happening with that is there were students who were quirky and they would go ahead and refer them and rule out autism, although some people were ruling out autism with just using a, um, an observation. Um, that was a county decision, but, you know, um, our guidance was that they should rule it out more efficiently, efficiently and consistently than a subjective observation. But in the meantime, um, what would happen is if they got to eligibility and they didn't qualify for anything else, they would go ahead and say, well, we're going to make them eligible for SCD because that gives them um, at least some type, type of support. Um, so whether or not they even had all the eligibility criteria met and they had all the information they needed, that was happening in some cases. So in order to make sure that those kids with autism could get services for pragmatics and to make sure that there was no confusion about this eligibility category, we made those, those changes. Um, the functional communication assessment summary, I'm hoping is going to be um, valuable for you guys. You know, for those students, and when I think about the students who probably would qualify for this um, assessment summary, um, I'm thinking about those kids who are either minimally or minimally verbal or nonverbal, who maybe are transitioning from birth to three, who can't participate in the norm reference testing. Um, you could maybe do some criterion reference testing with them, um, like the communication matrix or the ESIC three and that kind of thing. But, um, you know, for those kids who you can't do a language sample analysis on, um, you know, who maybe couldn't participate in a dynamic assessment right away, um, you can use that this functional assessment summary for those students. So the questions we're going to answer are where will we get the information to fill out the form? What tests or assessments could you utilize? Do you have to have formal test results? And what kind of impact will a student who has characteristics that make them a candidate for this assessment have to be have to be eligible for speech or language therapy? Well, um, for the functional communication assessment summary, there are check boxes, but there are also data sources and um, a place to describe the performance. The way to use this form is to look at the, the question, um, communication interaction, how can you describe their initiation, topic maintenance, turn taking, opening, closing conversations. 
you're going to have to list the data sources here. So the data sources, depending on the student, it could be a parent interview. It could be a birth to three provider interview. It could be, um, you know, something that um, you've observed. If, if they're in a classroom setting and you've just gotten, you know, a referral to test them or you pick them up during screening, um, you could maybe have some observation that you've seen too. But you're going to have to go in and describe that performance. Um, and then um, you're going to check whether or not they're successful, usually successful, frequently unsuccessful, or not successful. And these are going to be really kind of comparable to your no impact, minimal impact, moderate impact, and substantial impact. So you're going to have different data sources for these. You know, for some of them, like I said, it might be an interview or an observation for communication intention. Um, you know, to identify communication intents, an easy way to do that is the communication matrix because it's going to identify all the intents for you. Um, it's also going to give you that chart that you can attach, that profile that you can attach um, that will give you um, information about not only the intents, but how they're requesting it, what they're using, um, if they're using body you know, movements or if they're using objects, um, all of those kinds of things you can gather. So you may not be testing that student directly, but you are gathering information that you need for this summary. Here again, your data sources would be listed. It might be an ESIC-3 that you're using um, for some of these um, because the ESIC-3 has a pre-language um, subtest. Um, so those kinds of tests can give you this information. Um, any of you who use the, the real or, or the Rosetti, um, all those tests can give you information that you can use to plug into this um, summary. Um, and then communication methods. Here again, you're going to have to, you know, document your sources and describe the performance and comprehension, you know, um, indicating comprehension, what others say, sign or show. So you're going to get this from a variety of sources. You may choose to use some aspects of the preschool language scale um, and not use the entire test or use the composite, but use some of those um, test items if they'd be appropriate for the child. It just depends. But, you know, just think that for these functional communication assessment summaries, it's going to give you a way to gather some really important information that's going to help you plan the goals um, that you may not get if you're just doing anecdotal notes and that kind of thing based on um, parent interview. And then the effect on educational performance. Remember that depending on the, on the student, it, their impact may not be academic. It can be social and it can be um, vocational. Um, you're going to have some students who maybe are um, have um, um, intellectual disabilities, severe intellectual disabilities um, that this might be appropriate for. Um, so just remember what you're looking for is which piece of, um, of educational performance you're looking for. And, um, you know, I get asked all the time, like for the preschoolers, how do we get that academic information? Do we wait and just, you know, um, wait until they get into academics and the answer is no, you're looking at social communicative functioning. Well, how do we get that for students who are just coming in for the first time for like birth to three transition or just, you know, parent referrals, that kind of thing? That's a great question because you're not going to be able to observe them in the classroom right away, but you can get that information about how they function at home and in the community and within their family and with friends um, from the parents or from birth to three providers and from data and information that you receive from birth to three providers. Um, we, Lisa Fisher, um, our preschool coordinator, 
um, special ed preschool coordinator and I have done some trainings for birth to three providers on our new eligibility criteria. And, you know, we've talked to them about the fact that they may be interviewed for some of these things and that they, you know, their information, their current information, up to date information is going to be very valuable um, for these um, eligibility meetings and in determining eligibility. Um, and we've also talked to them about the fact and gone through all of the um, information to let them see that our criteria is different than theirs. So hopefully trying to start everybody out on the right foot and not setting the parent up by saying you're going to have to fight for services and all that kind of thing. Um, and using this functional communication assessment summary here again, the hope is it's going to make it very clear to the um, eligibility committee where the, whether the student qualifies for services or not with an IEP. Um, I wanted to um, just take a second and see if you guys have any questions. If you don't, I have a document that um, I can go through with you, a question answer document that I can go through very quickly. Um, if you think of something later, um, we are going to be giving you, um, and I'm sorry for not saying this at the very beginning, um, certificate maintenance hour certificates. I mean, sorry, yeah, certificate maintenance hours certificates. So you'll get a certificate for attending this three and a half hour session. Um, it's already been approved by the Board of Examiners. We did not get it approved by ASHA just because we're, use, we're doing different lengths of time um, for each um, training, depending on what the county um, can in how long the county can let me have access. So um, you can still use it if you're ever audited for ASHA. Um, just keep the, you know, the agenda, the PowerPoint and um, your certificate and you'll be fine. But on that survey, there is a list um, for you to say anything, you know, to give suggestions about other ways I can help support you. Like I said, we have tried really hard to do videos and um, short webinars and, um, you know, provide directives as far as um, things that um, you need to know to be able to, to um, use the new eligibility criteria, but we are more than happy to provide anything else that might be helpful. Um, one thing that I always want to mention is I get asked all the time, does this mean that we have to go in and dismiss all the kids that we have on our caseload who maybe don't meet the eligibility criteria now? And the answer to that is definitely no, you're not going to do that. Um, what you are going to do is consider when it comes time to do your um, perhaps your annual review, depending on how they're doing, or their triennial especially, um, that might be a time that you, you know, go through the process and say, okay, they no longer have the educational impact, you know, um, that they need to qualify for services. Um, and that can be where you offer steps instead, um, you know, to help keep contact with the student and provide the tune-ups, but we are not saying that you need to go in and dismiss anyone. Um, the other thing is that um, as um, you go through this, just make sure that you're, you know, doing your new placements using the three prongs, using the eligibility criteria, and just make sure that you have enough information to support your, your recommendations and your opinions. Um, and if you, you know, if you have to use something more than, you know, the three items, you know, you can definitely do that. Just make sure that you have at least those three items proven um, as you get ready to to do it. So I'm not seeing anything in the chat box. Um, if you think of other questions later, you're more than welcome to email me or post them. Um, I'm going to go ahead and show this video quickly and then we'll go through just some quick question and answers that I sent out. Um, I guess it was a week before Christmas. It's been a long time now, um, but we'll go through those really quickly about reevaluation and that kind of thing. So um, actually, let me go ahead and pull that up now. Um, OK, so I'm going to stop sharing for a minute.
and um, these are just some questions that I sent out. Uh, we'll go through those very quickly until I, you know, unless I see something else um, pop up in the chat box. Okay, it says Jessica has a question. Yes, yeah, so you can. You're welcome to unmute. Um, however, you want to ask it, Jessica. Hi, Leanne. Can you hear me? Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. My question is about birth to three or parent referrals for children who are not yet able to attend preschool because they aren't four years old by the cutoff date. Mm -hmm. And when we're looking at those four components of the comprehensive assessment, right. the academic activities and the mm -hmm. academic tests and measures, right. I am not completely confident in what I need to be looking for to make a determination whether a child is eligible or not. I know you said that we're looking at social communication skills for children that are three years old or mm -hmm. a late four-year-old. Is there anything specific that we need to be doing or looking at to add to our eligibility? Sure. Um Actually, that's kind of explained in the guidance document. I apologize for not putting that piece in. Um, I was working on it yesterday, and so um, I just didn't add it to the to the PowerPoint. But you're going to be looking. You're going to be asking questions like, um, how do they request items at home? How do they interact with? siblings how do they interact with um, strangers they're gonna there you know are some questions that you can ask to get that information no you're not going to have um you know data that you can look up or work samples now you know if they're just if they are four-year-olds and you can get work samples and do observations and that's one thing for but for those birth to three kids that you don't have that information for that's another reason for using that functional communication summary as well because that doesn't ask for the academic information that the other assessment summaries do so we'll give you some questions to ask and how to gather that information for those kids who can participate in, you know, the testing situation. But for those kids who can't, for those three year olds, um, you could also use the functional communication assessment summary for that piece, which eliminates the, the academic um, issues. OK, thank you. Sure. Um, so just a couple of um, questions that have been asked. Um, you know, there's the question, the first question is about using the intelligibility and context scale for um, teachers. And Marie did say that you can use it with teachers, but as far as changing the questions or the any of the information, I would be hesitant to do that personally. Um, if we use the speech to um, speech to text for intelligibility, how do we calculate the percentage? Um, and that's if you're using a speech to text to gather um, a sample, uh, a language sample. Um, you could do a percentage of the intelligible utterances. Um, you can do a percentage of intelligible words. Um, but that's, you know, that's how you could kind of get around that. Um, if what are the options if they can't, you know, produce use the percentage consonants correct imitation? Um, the answer to that is use your professional judgment and select three of the five. Don't use that one. If you can't, if they can't participate in it, then, you know, select, select something else to use because it's not required. Um, can we use other teacher parent reports? Absolutely. Um, I know in my county we had worked on, we had a team that worked on developing our own um, kind of related to what we, you know, the information we wanted to gather. You can absolutely do that um, for your county and we're, gonna, we're going to be providing examples that you can either adapt or use yourself, um, but you absolutely can use in others because honestly we don't have ones as a part of our forms booklet that we provide. That's usually the county um, that determines that. 
Um, but some people don't know that because, you know, they just assume everybody in the state's doing what they're doing. Um, I know I did <laughs> when I first came up here um, and found out really quickly that, nope, that's not the way it happens. So just remember that, too, when you're asking your friends who work in other counties about how they're doing this process, they may be doing things a little differently because their director has determined that they will. And that is absolutely part of the director's job and right to do that. So um, don't compare and think everybody should be doing the same thing. Um, how many sounds do we count for R? I had um, one county that wanted me to count it as 32 sounds um, because they wanted each of the um, R vowels counted separately, each of the R blends. Um, but we're going to be counting it as two. Um, which um, they asked about the areas, like on the summary assessment forums where it says they have um, difficulty in, you know, one or more area. This just explains the areas. Like if you're looking at academics, it's reading math and language arts. Social is interaction with peers and adults, participation in activities, and vocational is included in um, job related skills and communication with coworkers. Um, where can I find out more information about dynamic assessment? This is where we have the, the links for Dr. Brandel, um, Dr. Brandel's training and her PowerPoint, as well as the dyma, uh, dynamic assessment videos from ASHA. And this tells you what the um, topics are for those ASHA videos. And then the functional assessment summary. Um, do we just go through and check what we think the student can and can't do? And we just went through that and said, no, you need to find the information um, using it, some type of, of tool or some type of source um, and then document what you found out and then make that determination. Um, for reevaluation, um, a lot of times counties have just selected that they typically write um, progress review for communication instead of doing another full evaluation. Um, and then they use existing data and previous testing to requalify students. Um, it says, I'm assuming that can't happen any longer and we need to do the new criteria scales and go ahead. Um, according to policy, uh, within three years of the date of the last determination of eligibility, um, uh, more frequently the parent or teacher requests um, or if the LEA determines they need it, um, the LEA must conduct an appropriate, as appropriate, an individual multidisciplinary evaluation, reevaluation. The purpose of this evaluation is to determine the student's educational needs and continued eligibility for special education um, and whether there are any additions or modifications to the special ed program that are needed. Um, as a part of the reevaluation, IEP team and other qualified professionals as appropriate must review existing evaluation data on the student, including current IEP, which is what you can use for your progress update, evaluations and information provided by the parent and student, um, parent information report or parent interview, best practices to update that since hopefully the information has changed, current classroom-based local or state assessments and classroom-based observations. So that has to be current. That means that you can't use that um, list um, and you can't use that um, old observation. You have to have a current one um, to answer prong two and observations by parents, teachers, and related service providers. So those are all um, some things that need to be done according to policy. Um, so suppose the, the um, MDET team agrees they don't need to do additional testing because honestly, to me, it's so much more beneficial to give information uh, related to IEP goals and an update and current status than it is to give a single word articulation test just to re-administer it. Um, so you can do um, progress review or com for communication or communication update on the reevaluation plan. Um, you can use your therapy logs and anecdotal notes to determine um, if they meet the continue to meet the disorder criteria and include information about stimulability, intelligibility, which you're going to know um, from working with that student. 
um, for speech and informal dynamic assessment and probes for language. You're going to be doing dynamic assessment as you're doing therapy. And so that information um, can all be gathered from your therapy logs. And this should be information you've gathered during therapy sessions or collaboration. It's not new information that you have to test to obtain. Um, number three says that you must review current classroom based local or state assessments. So you are going to have to look at that information. Um, there's one option available in the in case the student no longer meets the eligibility criteria in one of the designated exceptionalities and it's located on the eligibility committee report and it um, applies to reevaluations only. And it says if a student no longer meets the eligibility criteria and one of the designated exceptionalities, the EC uh, must provide the justification for continued eligibility. So if they don't meet the eligibility criteria and you feel strongly that they need to continue, then your eligibility committee can determine um, based on the justification that you write here that they need to continue services. Um, remember, you don't need to do a formal assessment, such as an articulation test or language test to determine the student meets prong one. And regulations outline and policy apply to all students, including speech only students. So that's those are just some questions that I've been asked and that I've gathered as we've gone along. And um, um, I'll be sure and drop that in your in your um, your um, resource folder as well. OK, so I see some questions here. Um, Joe says, is there a comprehensive list of what's required versus what's optional? Because what is OK to use professional judgment other than the charts provided early in the session? I'm not sure I understand. Comprehensive list of what's required versus what's optional because what is OK to use professional judgment other than the charts provided earlier in this session. All right. OK, I'm still trying to figure out what you're saying there, Joe. If you want a list of what's mandated for you to do at each one, the only thing I, I will say to that is I have to be really careful that I don't assist you by predetermining your placements. That's the reason everything is left up to the eligibility committee. And for me to give you a comprehensive list, if you can explain that um, more clearly to me in your survey, then I'll be happy to try to do that. But just know that I have to kind of try to be careful about not over recommending. Um, the other thing is that, um, you know, so many times I think people have just gotten used to us trying to provide as much information as possible, but I cannot train you on every single aspect of of what we have to do as a part of your job. You've had that training, you've had the experience and you've got ASHA you can look forward to look at too. Um, but you know, there's some I, I get requests all the time. I need this list. I need, you know, a list of how to read um, work samples. That's one of the big ones I've gotten from a couple of friends of mine. You know, you have to show me how to do that, um, that kind of thing. And, um, you know, as we can, we'll be happy to do that and support as we can. But um, I'm just not really sure I'm understanding exactly what you're asking here. Um, so if you could tell me a little more, more easily or just even call me and explain it to me. I'd be happy to try to try to help if I can. Um, and then Anne says to get a narrative language sample from a student we currently have enrolled. Do we need to get formal permission to evaluate? Yes, you do um, because you are going to be using it as an evaluation um, instrument and you're not doing it with all your other students. Um, if it was something you did with all of your students, um, then that would be one thing, but it's not. Um, so yes, you do need to get permission to do that. Um, I am going to go ahead and drop the um, survey link. Um, there's one for the QR code and one for the link in the chat box. So you can go ahead and start your survey. Um, I'm going to need you to have this completed by Friday at midnight um, in order to get your certificate. Um, and then we're going to go ahead and watch this little short video and one more video and we'll finish up.
Mercedes. know that listening to this sometimes can seem really overwhelming and um, I hope that you will just take a breath and realize that we are here to support while I can't <laughs> go through every one of your um, students with you and, and talk about each one individually we can help try to prov provide as much universal support as we possibly can and um, targeted um, support when it's appropriate. Um, so please reach out um, if you have questions and I'm sure there are going to be, you know, this is a big change, but just remember this is not something that is not, <laughs> hasn't been out there for years. It has been. And when I said you can look to ASHA, we try to incorporate as much of ASHA as we possibly can because I have my C's. I want to do what ASHA's guidance provides as much as possible. Um, but we also have to follow the law. And the law in this case is IDEA and our regulations with policy 2419. Um, and so if you look at the information on ASHA, like I said, just go in and look at role of, and responsibilities of SLP and you'll see that, you know, ensuring educational relevance is one of the one of the roles that we have now. Prevention is a role. So providing steps is a role. Um, and, you know, I love this quote from Maya Angelou. I use it all the time because, you know, we've all been doing what we thought was best. Um, but now, because of the research and what's happening in other states and, and, you know, the training we provided, we know that we need to do better. And um, when we know better, uh, we have to do better. And I'm sure all of you guys will. Um, there's That's never a doubt in my mind. Um, but sometimes to get started, it just all it takes is a little push. And um, we're going to end with this. So thank you so much um, for your attention today. Thank you um, for your questions and um, concerns. Um, I appreciate the fact that you want to do everything correctly and um, am here. Um, you guys know how to get a hold of me. Um, please let me know if I can be of any assistance. Um, take care and have a wonderful um, week. Thanks, everyone. <laughs>